Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. It is a noon hour on Thursday, folks. Ted Rolfson here, downtown Honolulu, our Think Tech studios, uh, where we have our show, Where the Drone Leads, where every week or two weeks we bring to the, our uh, trusted audience information and views, uh, facts and issues associated with the emerging world of unmanned air system, drones, remotely piloted aircraft, whatever you want to call them. One thing about this show that's really incredible is the people you get to meet that are already involved in the business and the way we can work together on uh, bringing ideas together that work on, on the the future of education, the future of problem solving and such like that associated with drones. Today we have two newcomers on the show, Dr. Zach Trimble, right down the street from UH Manoa, Engineer, Mechanical Engineering Department. Thanks for coming on, Zach. Thank you, Ted. You're definitely nervous, it. are you? Right. Yeah, of course oh, okay, I am nervous. Right. Yeah, this okay. is first, you said first, first for me. First so. time, right. And then, yeah, thanks uh, for having me on. Clear across the, uh, the, the, the country here, across the Pacific and across the country in Santa Bay and Salem, Massachusetts, is Bob Geller. Bob, you there? Yes, so there you are. Thank you, Ted. Okay, and uh, Bob is uh, coming to us as an aerospace expert and a uh, small unmanned air systems pilot, operator, designer, and such, and as a uh, practitioner of the trade. And what's most interesting, I think, is that both of our guests look at the problem of UAS from the inside out as m perhaps more than from the outside in. And that's what I wanted to bring to our discussion. I think so much of the time we see our people we work with thinking about it from the outside in. You open the box, take the thing out, and you get amazed and, and, and amused by what you've got. But what we don't understand is what's inside, what makes this thing work. And so from a perspective of a practitioner, such as Bob, and from an educator, such as Zach, we've got to somehow break through that and get the kids interested and get even the users interested in operating from a perspective of what's inside. And how can we make that inside better? So uh, Bob, let me, let me start with you. Give us your kind of background on where you come from and how you enter the UAS mix and how we might take this, this issue of understanding what the computational software and mathematics are that make these things work, and how do we stand that tall in our educational outreach? And I realize that's a lot, so I'm just uh, tossing it your way, sir. Okay, thank you. I'm really glad to be, be here today. So just a little bit about my background. You know, loved aviation from a very young age, uh, gone to air shows, uh, always wanted to be a pilot, got my private pilot's license about 10 years ago, uh, fixed wing, uh, single engine land. And then I was also getting into the remote control aircraft as a hobby. And in conjunction with that, I uh, worked in the aerospace industry in a, a jet engine business for, for about 15 years, working with regulators and, and understanding kind of the safety practices that go along with manned aviation. And kind of coming along in parallel in, in my free time was the, the unmanned stuff. So starting with fixed wing and then helicopters, uh, multi-rotors when those first came out, and in the very early stages of that, when they were still taking apart Nintendo uh, from, uh, remotes to get the accelerometers out to make the flight controllers, they've come a long way in the last five or six years. And just learning more about you know the programming that goes into that, the PID tuning, and we'll, we'll talk more about that later. Uh, but to touch on your other question about how to bring that to the forefront of, of the schools, you know, I think there's, there's a huge STEM opportunity with, with UAVs because it touches on everything. It touches on mechanical engineering, if you want to design the structures and the, the mounts that hold the components on the aircraft. It touches on electrical engineering, you have to understand uh, circuits and, and control laws and soldering and current flow, voltages, watts, all those things. And it touches on computer science. You have to know how to code and how to write software and, and set different parameters uh, through command lines and, and other functions. And it also touches on physics. You know, as, you, as you tune these things uh, through the, the control laws and as you fly them and understanding the relationships and the trade-offs of you know, torque versus top speed versus power, different propellers, different motors, the effect of center of gravity, you know, all those things can be learned by, by anyone, really, uh, and, and especially students. And so getting those things, and, and again, 3D printers as well, have a huge role in UAVs. A lot of this stuff just doesn't exist. You can't go buy parts for these things. 
you have to make it. And so thinking creatively on how to design a, a, a 3D model and then make that into a product that you can put on your aircraft. So getting those, those things into the schools, I think the cost has come down quite a bit. It used to be a pretty high barrier to entry uh, from a cost standpoint. Now you can get you know, entry level set up for you know, a couple hundred dollars and, and cheaper if you 3D print your own. So I think getting those into the hands of, of young students and, and letting them kind of learn and, and grow with that is, is the way to, to get them thinking about those parts as opposed to buying an off-the-shelf product that has all those things already done for you and all you have to do is charge the battery and, and take off. So you're starting at the component level and understanding those trade-offs I think is important. So we have the inside outlook that you just expressed, and then we, we know we have the outside in look that, we, that, that all of our, uh, uh, our, our peers and folks who work with drones normally come from. Uh, the, the concept of a drone is really that of motion management and position measurement, and somehow putting those two together in some kind of a software orientation that achieves the right positioning in some efficient way. So Zach, how do we... How do we take what Bob just said and, and think about packaging that, certainly at a graduate level, undergraduate level, and, and even down to the elementary school level? How do we take an IMU and hold it in your hand and have somebody understand what that's all about? Not feeling any pressure. No. <laughs> well, cer certainly um, we need the outside in look. We need people to be able to look at drones and imagine what I can do with them. Imagine what new data I can get. Imagine what new mission I can do. We need people to do that to drive a desire and end use. But as you just mentioned, it's an issue of, do I know where I am? Do I know where I'm going? Am I under control? I am I doing the drone. I, yeah, I being the drone. Right. Am I going where I am supposed to be going? And we need people to see that from the inside. And as you said, can I take, do I understand that I am you in my hand? Do I understand its limitations? Do I understand the GPS signal, and do and I understand about their failure modes? all of that? Yeah. Yes, it's giving me a position and a location, a pose estimate, but there's an error in that. And we need people to imagine those new uses of drones, as I said, from the outside in, but understand that I need to advance the insides to get to those new ones and get excited about advancing those insides. And I think we're being relatively successful at that up at the University of Hawaii. I mean, we've got a fairly large contingent of students running in what's known as a VIP program. And I know that you're familiar with that, but for the audience, it's a, known as vertically integrated projects. And what happens is we get together, as uh, was mentioned, we get together mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, all working together from at various ranges from freshmen up through doctoral students on these insights to say, okay, how do I get it, the drone, it being the drone, to have better location, to be able to do the next mission better. So Good. we so can we're imagine actually putting the next a screen thing. on there and saying, hey, can we, can we see the stuff that falls through the screen and fix it? Is there better ways to do motion management, better ways to do the math of projecting the right trajectory and that kind of thing, better ways to look at fault propagation? That's, if we can, if we can find a way to make that what is the takeaway out of this out of these projects and out of the education system, that is the place where the, the future lies, right there, getting all that. I mean, as an educator in mechanical engineering, I can't agree with you more. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I say, this program, we get to get people who think alike together a lot. They don't generally pick people on the show who don't agree. So. <laughs> That's good. Bob, what do you think about that from your experience in industry and, and, uh, and, and your uh, perception of what operates successfully and what doesn't operate successfully from an operator perspective. And I'm really thinking here of fault accommodation, uh, symptom identification, and what to do about it. As we all know, we're all three of us airplane pilots, and you have 30 seconds from the time the first indication of something to fix it. As long as you have a lot of altitude and a lot of ideas, you're probably okay. In drones, you have five seconds, and you may not have the proper knowledge of what the fault symptom is and what the what the indication is and what the consequence is. Therefore, you don't know what to do about it. So, Bob, from your operating experience, uh, how do we tie that all together? Yeah, so, so a couple different ways. Uh, you know, one way is reactively. So through the telemetry data that you're being sent uh, from the aircraft while it's in the airborne, you're going to get alerts. So there's, depending on the flight control system that you have and the ground control system, so the ground control system being the laptop, if you're using a laptop to control the aircraft. Uh, some systems aren't quite that sophisticated. You might just only have a handheld remote. Uh, but 
and, you, and maybe you're getting audible or, or uh, visual cues from the aircraft through flashing lights or buzzing phones. But however it comes to you, you're getting some feedback that there's an issue, whether that be you've lost GPS, uh, the battery is getting too low, uh, you, you know, other things like a multi-rotor, if you start losing you know, propellers or motors, things like that, usually that departs controlled flight and there's not a lot you can do. But things like batteries getting too low or, or GPS failure, uh, reacting to those things as a pilot. So if you, if you have already getting too low, you, you, you land it. A lot of times there's things you can do ahead of time in your, in your configurations to set fail states. So when those things happen, they're dealt with automatically. So when a battery gets too low, it turns around, comes back, and lands. Uh, if you choose, you can switch into manual mode and do that yourself. But where the industry is really heading is trying to get more proactive. And so by that, I mean looking at flight logs. So in, in performing statistical analysis and trying to forward look and forward project on anomalies. So it, as you see vibrations starting to increase, maybe you've got a motor that's about to go bad or a bearing that needs maintenance. Or as you see current draw start to increase, maybe you have an electrical issue or, or a uh, you know other issues that are, that are that are presenting themselves before the failure so that you can do that maintenance proactively before you have the problem because as you mentioned you don't have a lot of time when the failure occurs especially the more catastrophic ones so trying to get ahead of that is really the way that the industry is trying to, to trend and, and drive what through software and data analytics well, that's interesting to know and that also brings up a question uh, if some element of industry or some element of academia comes up with a bright idea, you mentioned forecasting potential failure. If there was a, a brilliant solution that, that showed up somewhere, how would we as the larger industry capture that and find a way to employ it widely as opposed to have it you know, controlled by some proprietary uh, means by which you have to buy it? Because this, information, this whole industry is based on sharing a lot of information, a lot of capability. Uh, do we have any kind of a commercial advisory group that, that takes those, those kind of bright ideas, Bob, and does something to standardize them? Uh, they're in the process of being formed. So there's lots of different groups that are, that are trying to shape some of that um, through either, either legislation or, or just through guidelines and guidance. Uh, you know, there, there's a couple of those. There's also quite a bit of open source in, in the industry. You know, Pixhawk is, is one example through ArcuPilot. So there's, you know, there's conduits to, to kind of get things out there that, you know, in, in a way that'll be broadly shared and, and less in a, in a kind of commercial fashion. So that, that would be one conduit. And then, I, you know, I, I guess kind of integrating it into uh, software platforms that are, you know, already existing. You know, so there's there's some web-based tools that are used for, for logbook analysis and, and the, or data log analysis that are, are trying to do some of these things, and that would be the place to kind of inject and infuse some of the students' work uh, potentially in, 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 a, in a broader sharing of, of that knowledge. So it sounds like, Zach, we need some students involved here uh, on, the day, on the websites all the time, hitting different websites for different information and pulling this insight together. It's all over the place. Yeah, I would agree with that, and um, I think it is the student-built websites that actually are an, an interesting repository for this type of information. Um, there are many universities, probably all of them, that have some form of a, a UAV program going on, and, and nearly all of those UAV teams maintain some sort of a website, and so um, the hard part is, is how, do I, how do I check them all? So much information. Yeah, how it's, you, it's an yeah. information overload. To, a, to an extent, but um, yeah, the, the, the student teams themselves uh, building up their websites and, and, and sort of monitoring what's out there. Now, the, there, there's a challenge, right? If I come up with something very novel, do I really want to just go open source Bob, on it? Bob, close your ears. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and, and that is a challenge, and, and we, we do have students that struggle with that. Mm -hmm. um, th this idea of, you know, do I do I really want to do this while I'm at school, or I have this great ah, idea, and should okay. I wait another year and then try okay. to? When I'm out of school, I can make some money on this <laughs> thing correct. instead of work, working, having to do it as part of my uh, schoolwork. Yeah, yeah. We, we do struggle with that a bit, not okay. not a ton, but some. Well, most interesting. Well, let's uh, let's get back to where this all fits into education when we get back from our first uh, and only one minute break today. My name is Mark Shklov. 
I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Hi, I'm Bill Sharp, host of Asian Review here on Think Tech Hawaii. Join me every Monday afternoon from 5 to 5.30 Hawaii Standard Time for an insightful discussion of contemporary Asian affairs. There's so much to discuss, and the guests that we have are very, very well informed. Just think, we have the upcoming negotiation between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un. The possibility of Xi Jinping, the leader of China, remaining in power forever. We'll see you then. It is still the noon hour on Thursday, folks. Ted Ralston here and Zach Trimble, downtown Honolulu. Jack, Zach, thanks for coming on the show. First time yeah, for... uh, from UH Manoa and far across the sea over in Salem, Massachusetts. We have Bob Gettler waiting uh, to come back on. There you are, Bob. So we were talking before the break about education and such and how critical that is to all of this. And there's so many elements to that. We could never, we could never exhaust uh, all the time we have and, um, uh, and still be talking about education. But about problem solving, we were talking about uh, about the, the information, there's so much information everywhere in terms of different methods that have been put together for the technical elements of drones and such. Bob, you from an industry perspective, how do you, how do you make sure when you generate a solution to a problem, you've taken advantage of whatever's out there? How do you package up a solution when somebody comes to you with an operational or a design problem? Uh, if you just take us through that, that we really need to import that into our educational process. Sure. sure. So, you know, one of the things that I try to do is, is stay up to speed on the different trade trade journals and, and, and news feeds, uh, websites, you know, follow a lot of different companies on LinkedIn, just to kind of keep an, my fingers on the pulse of the new products that are coming out. Also attend trade shows at that Exponential this, this uh, past spring. Interest to see, you know, talk to the different vendors and, and look at their products to try to have a catalog and a Rolodex in my mind of, of what's out there. Uh, also, it's a very good relationship with the different vendors and suppliers that they you know, kind of give me ideas on things they're working on. Uh, we we'll collaborate on a few things if there's something that's not currently in their catalog, but maybe something that they could develop to fill a niche. And, you know, as much as possible, because of the speed that everything moves in this industry, we try to use integrating off-the-shelf uh, products just because the product life cycle and the development cycles to develop something brand new and do an MPI are often too long. And so knowing what's out there and what you can use in a sometimes creative way to meet the needs of your application is very important. So the combination of that and then also just kind of collaborating with my peers in, in different industries uh, just to understand what they know. So that, that's kind of the first step. If we can't find anything that currently exists, then we start thinking about what can we quickly wrap a prototype or make if necessary. Okay, that's interesting. So you basically think of object-based integration. You have a bunch of objects that you can integrate if somebody provided the API or some other integration ROS or something uh, format for you to follow. Uh, it, it, let me throw one at you just, as, just to hear how you think about it. Say you have a need to get a, a, a drone or UAS that operates outdoors in clear air and clear signals has to operate also in an urban canyon with a lot of potential signal reflection or signal blocking and has to operate uh, undercover somehow, that is under a roof or in a tunnel. So you have these transitions mm -hmm. from uh, the, the quality of the GPS, for example, is gonna be quite varied across that range. How would you think through putting together a solution to that particular problem? So for that particular problem, and this is this is a new thought for me, you know, this particular application, I haven't had to deal with this, but what I would start with for the canyon side is probably some kind of mesh network, you know, to do either that or, or look at you know, what, what kind of data do we need to send back? You know, what, what bandwidth do we need? And do, are we okay with just having the command and control or C2, which doesn't take a lot of data? Because that's going to help go the, the system network that we need to build or take advantage of. So if it's low data rates, uh, maybe you can get away with SACCOM. If it's 
you know, or, or, or lower frequencies, which have, you know tend to have better object penetration and, and longer ranges. If you need high data rates, you got to go to the higher frequencies, which you're going to need to probably have you know, some additional radios placed strategically. Um, and you'd want to do some analysis looking at, at terrain and uh, doing some measurements and, and uh, some testing to see where the optimal places are, because you're essentially building a, a cellular network in a way, uh, or a Wi-Fi network, you know, with, with these repeater stations along your route. Once you get to the tower, or I'm sorry, the tunnel, where you're going to be GPS denied, that you almost need to have a second uh, navigation system on the aircraft to switch to when you get to that environment, because you're, you're gonna, not going to have a uh, clear view of, of enough satellites to have accurate positioning. So that's where you're probably going to need to move to, you know, a, um, either like an optical flow using camera systems or, you know, some kind of localized based positioning system, you know, with some nodes in the tunnel and making that transition from, you know, it almost have two separate flight paths. So the aircraft would fly the route through the canyon on GPS, and then once you get to the tunnel, it would switch over to a new flight plan with, with this uh, you know, GPS denied navigation system. So what, what uh, Bob's outlined by going through that thinking process is something really, I think, instructive and useful to us. It makes me think that in the, in the buildup of instruction and educational themes here, we have what we just thought of maybe as a positioning aspect, that is the position feedback, the GPS. Every, you have to know your position regardless of what the mission is, and so the different environmental conditions determine how, what systems you're gonna have, what electronics and what uh, software to do that positioning work. We have position. So position management or position measurement is one thing. Position management through motion understanding, motion modeling and motion compensation is a, another category. Uh, the uh, transitioning from one of these modes to the other, the failure modes that accompany and what the indication is and the response and what kind of training we go through in simulations uh, you, you can think of four or five major categories into which the, the technology is starting to collect here, buckets of technology. Is that how you guys look at it from an educational construction perspective? Yeah, I think so. I'm known for having a couple of different sayings that I, I repeat okay. many, many times to students. One of them, the first one being, define what success looks like. That's great. Oh, just hold that for thought. For, define what success looks like. How do students react to that? Can they define success very well? It's a, it's a big challenge at the first. It, it is very much a challenge at the first. Once we've had them for a year, they're getting much better at that. But being able to just, in very simple terms, state to somebody, if I have to prove to you that my system works, what are the, th what are the steps I have to take? What does success look like? What does this machine, this drone, this I item look like when I'm done? And more importantly, I have, somehow I have to prove to you that it solves your problem. And so I have to think about what are the tests I have to go through to do that. And then it very much defines what are the things I need so to do. So even for the subject that Bob just described, that is the position identification, you could even define a success parameter for that. Right. And a response to challenges or threats, electrical storms, for example, or uh, heavy rain, or whatever it might be that, that degrades signals. So you could think of a measurement of success, and you could think of the challenges under which the thing has to sur survive, and that would structure the thought, wouldn't it, in terms of what the, what the elements of the technical solution are. That's correct, yeah, that's exactly right. That's, and, and by knowing what it has to look like at the end, it's much easier for me to find what I have to work on now. And then the other key word is, what's your most critical module? And I think that's what you, you just identified from what Bob was talking about as the most critical module. As a pre previous engineer, your mind just did it. And, and that most critical module was, okay, I, you, you gave me a mission and, and flying was pretty easy and you know, communicating was, was difficult, but, but localizing was hardest. And so I've defined the thing that I gotta focus on and I've gotta f get that taken care of first. Because unless that doesn't work, I might as well not do the rest of it. And so Amen. that's the next thing that we talk about, is once you've defined what success looks like, dig out of that the thing that everything hinges on, the most critical module. The reason I thought of that example is because we're getting into uh, UAS integration with uh, manned airspace. We have the FAA IPP program, which we're actually part of, to Alaska. That's dealing with 400 feet and below. And we have the, F the NASA SIO, SOI or SIO program, which is dealing with 500 feet and above. So it's two different programs looking at at integrating with manned aircraft. That means detect and avoid, it means remain well clear, it has all the proper terms. 
But that's going to require precision information about location that works bar none. It has to work at all times or you haven't got a safe system. And we think in terms of drones as positioning within two or three feet. We want to get up near a building or want to get near a tree to look at what the bird's nest egg looks like or something like that. And, and these are really precise positioning issues in complex environments. And yet in our airplane experience, we have nothing like that. I mean, uh, 100 feet goes by in the altimeter, you don't even notice it. And uh, so uh, we think of you know, 100 feet as a positioning precision. Well, we're talking about a couple of feet in the world of, of, of drones. But, so yeah. th this, this issue of, uh, of uh, integration is gonna define or, or drive a lot of these needs for thinking about these parametric issues, measures of success, and then uh, the testing required to get to that point and the proof that you're done. Well, you've also hit on another thing that's, that's important here, and that, that is the idea that oftentimes I can't get it done with one technology, and that's really where the systems come, systems thinkings come in again. I can't get it all done with GPS. I, I have to, you know, coming in to be next to this building, I can't have enough GPS accuracy to be next to that building. So I still need GPS to get to where I need to be, but then suddenly I need to switch to a LIDAR or a radar or something to give me that very fine precision. So again, now suddenly I have to start mixing systems together, and we really need students that are interested in that. That's interesting. And you talked about the school, the educational environment where you have a chance to speak about these things up front. You have a semester orientation, so things aren't done till the end. Bob, in the commercial world, uh, you have to go through these discussions pretty quickly and get to a solution plan and a critical path that's going to work for you uh, in order to survive and make money. So, uh, that's right. do you have that same orientation that Zach has in terms of a wide open conversation about the various issues before you hit hit a actual execution path? Yeah, so, so I think what Zach touched on is, is, is an important part of the thought process of thinking about your, your kind of critical path and in your your your, 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 your your hinging point or your, your, you know, your most difficult part, make sure you solve that. Because the last thing you want to do is, is do all the easy stuff and then get to the hard part and not have a good solution. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, you know, the other thing to think about too is if you're doing things that are going to require waivers, you got to back off of that all of the review cycle time for the FAA. So not only do you have to move fast in general, but now you, a lot of your time is consumed with uh, the regulatory agencies approving your solution. So part of that measure of success then that Zach talked about is having something that the regulators can understand and can find compliance with. So that's another whole dimension here. And we're uh, yep. about uh, out of time. We didn't get to your favorite subject, Bob, of PID loop tuning. And we'll have to hit that on a follow-on conversation. But I wanted to thank you very much for your insight from a commercial perspective on this emerging game of uh, optimizing micro technology into successful drone operations. So Bob, uh, once again, thanks for coming on from over in Salem, Massachusetts. And Zach, thanks for coming on down all the way from Manoa to be part of this. Yeah, long drive, long yeah, drive. Yeah, long drive. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you, Ted. And uh, we'll see you all next week.